Dr. Hugo Santos, uh, who is going to talk to us. Well, Hugo Santos comes from the best university in Portugal. All others are the second one. Um, who is going to talk to us about um, non-invasive biomarker panel for bladder cancer tumor staging. So thank you very much for accepting to be here today, Hugo. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So actually, we are continuing talking about um, urinary tract uh, diseases. So my talk right now will be about bladder cancer and a few things more. Actually, these titles do not reflect my entire talk, but we'll see what I have later. Um, so the outline of my, my presentation is described here. Um, I will talk a little bit about the bladder cancer itself, the workflow we use, our results, and something new about urine preservation. So actually, the main goal of our research is to identify a protein signatures or um, ways of interactions of these proteins and how we can use this to um, have a personalized approach to treatment. So actually the main goal of our job is to identify the right target to um, administer the right drug to have the right outcome. So we decided to uh, face these challenges using proteomics. And in this particular case, we used uh, quant a label-free quantification to try to identify a panel of biomarkers in bladder, in bladder cancer. So bladder cancer, it's uh, the fourth most common neoplasm in the Western countries. It affects mostly men, and it's very expensive, mostly because of the techniques that are used for diagnosis. Um, actually, there are other alternatives, but most of the time, uh, diagnosis is done with a cytoscopy, uh, which al also can be used for treatment. Uh, it's invasive, it's, uh, it has low sensitivity, and it's expensive. So uh, actually, there are different stages of, of bladder cancer. A uh, more initial stage that we call TA, that is a, a tumor in the bladder lumen. Then it can go to stage T1, where the tumor invades urotelium and lamina propria, and then it invades uh, the muscle, which is the state. Uh, we classify this as a, sta a stage T2+, plus, but actually you, even in these uh, more advanced stages, you can ha subdivide this. Um, and so our, our main aim here was to um, try to use to develop a strategy to differentiate these different stages. So, of course, if we have tumor bi um, biopsies would be um, very nice, but because urine is in direct contact with these tumors, actually it's a very nice sample to try to extract biological information. It's very easy to obtain, it's very cheap, and it's not painful. And so, uh, all of these job in bladder cancer was done using urine samples. <clears throat> so our workflow, it's very simple. We take a urine sample, we centrifuge to remove any cell debris, then we concentrate the urine using a ultrafiltration device, and then we decided to do a FASP digestion. So most of you are familiar with this kind of sample preparation methods, when we get the peptides, we go to LC-MSMS, some max quant analysis for label-free quantification, uh, per -Z's analysis, and then some um, protein interactions and to try to retrieve some, some molecular pathways or biological pathways that are deregulated in, in these different stages of tumors. So actually, because of the way we design our study, um, we have all, we have samples from the initial stage, T1 and T2+, plus, but we also have uh, normal urines and um, other uh, bladder diseases that are not tumors. But uh, our main goal was to differentiate stages. So actually, we have done this already, but my talk will be about, um, about this. We did multiple comparisons between the different stages, to try to differentiate and build 
a, or, or at least obtain a panel of proteins that can be used uh, to differentiate these stages. So actually, uh, we ended up with a group, fairly um, big group of proteins, total of 70 proteins that can be used as a finger mark of the different stages. So actually, what is represented here is the proteins, the different stages, and the color codes represent the abundance of the proteins. It means that red color means more abundance, the blue color less abundant. And if you look here, uh, you can actually can identify patterns that can be uh, used for differentiation of the different stages. For example, over here, you can differentiate stage T2+. Plus. This group of proteins over here can differentiate Ta, and here you can differentiate very well T1. And this larger number can differentiate T1 very well because the, the, the levels of these proteins are down-regulated when compared to the other stages. Um, so actually, this was the, the panel of proteins that we are now trying to validate. And we, by looking at the functions of these proteins, actually there are very interesting things that we can work with, not only for diagnosis, but all also to um, improve treatment. So, for example, we have identified 10 proteins that are uh, related to activation of complement cascade, which is very important in tumor microenvironment because it enhances tumor growth and increases metastasis. So there, there, is, there, there are a way here to develop uh, some kind of drugs or inhibitors to, to, to target this, this molecular pathway. Uh, other interesting proteins, and actually from 70, almost 50, 50 proteins were related to neutrophil degranulation. Neutrophil degranulation, it's a very complex topic in, in, in cancer because it can be good for, to, to minimize cancer progression, but recent studies has been linked uh, this process actually with increased angiogenesis and tumor progression. And a lot of proteins were related um, with this pathway, and most of these proteins were upregulated in the more advanced stages. So actually, clearly in bladder cancer, all of these proteins that are related to neutrophil degranulation are something that it's not good in terms of, of uh, prediction of disease outcome. We also identify a rather small group of 10 proteins that are um, um, correlated with metabolism of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 and 2. And this might ring a bell about hypertension, but uh, also there are some studies that correlate this transformation in angiotensin 1 and 2 with migration, invasion, proliferation, and angiogenesis in cancer. And actually, there are right now some inhibitors that can uh, be used in these, in these pathways, at least to um, be used as a complement treatment in, in, in bladder cancer. So, for example, these inhibitors of angiotensin-converting enzymes and AG2 type 1 receptor blockers, they can be used against development of distant metastasis in, 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 in bladder cancer. So, about m the, the second part of my talk, which is something new about uh, urine preservation. Uh, urine preservation is something that is very critical in our work, and we, we face some, some, some troubles with it in the beginning. Uh, this work was, was also published recently. This, this has been done mostly by Luis Carvalho. He also has a uh, shotgun poster later on in the evening. And so the big troubles we face with, with urine preservation, it was when we put a urine into a, a minus, minus 20 or minus 60 degrees, then when you take the urine out, you always end with a precipitate. 
this precipitate is protein, or at least it contains proteins. So it's not good to have these kind of precipitations unless you can recover entirely what is in the precipitate. And what is recommended for these cases is the addition of a basic buffer, like trace buffer, and it was possible to at least recover most of the pellet, but anyway, there was something uh, remaining there. So, although we minimized a little bit the problem with the precipitation, it wasn't uh, eliminated completely. And so we decided to investigate a, a way to preserve urine without this problem of precipitation. And so what we decided to do was to somehow uh, try to preserve urine at room temperature. And to do that, we, we took a device that is used for its stabilization. You might have heard of Denator T1 for tissue preservation. You take a tissue, you put it into a card, then the card goes to the, into the machine, the machine increases the temperature into the tissue in a very fast way, and by increasing temperature, you denaturate enzymes and you prevent uh, tissue degradation. So it's exactly the same principle that we have used here, but we decided to use it in, in urine. The problem of urine is that you have a very big sample for a very small card. So you can't store urine directly, otherwise you will lose a lot of things. And so what we did was a comparison among its stabilization of urine, uh, its stabilization followed by preservation at minus 60, and the st a standard condition just by freezing urine. And because um, we have a large volume of urine and we want to store the proteins, we decided to do a immobilization of the proteins into a fast membrane. You concentrate the proteins on the membrane, and after that, you put the FASP device, which is very small, into the maintainer card, and then the maintainer card goes to the denator instrument to increase temperature and denaturate the proteins. Please remember that the proteins are sticked on top of a, mem of a FASP membrane. So there you are, the, the FASP membrane going in into the maintainer card, and the maintainer card goes to the its stabilization process, and then we take that, that um, stabilization urines into the bench. And the urines, they were stored for six months in the bench. So actually, we have two time points after treatment and after six months of storage. So then, because our proteins were on top of a fast membrane, we go through a regular fast digestion method, and then our peptides were analyzed by label-free quantitative mass spectrometry. Uh, of course, the way we design the experiments, we have multiple comparisons that we can do, different conditions, uh, after time, the beginning of the study, zero months, and after six months of preservation, and you can also do some comparisons among the different, the different uh, preservation techniques. And so we were kind of surprised to see that um, we don't have practically any difference between, um, between the beginning of the study and after six months of preservation. So if you look to this volcano plot, um, condition A, it's its stabilization preserved at room temperature, and in terms of concentration of proteins, they maintain more or less the same among the six, the six months. And you, you see more or less the same, the same behavior for the other preservation methods. Actually, if you try to use these data for hierarchical clustering, you can see here that you can group um, condition A at the beginning and after six months for different urines that we have tested. And the other conditions that were stored at minus 10, 20, at minus 60, they group into a, a second cluster. What is interesting is that there are these 
protein, these, these conditions that were stored at room temperature, they seem to have slightly higher abundance of protein, although those, those um, differences were not statistically significant from the other preservation methods. So actually, what we can conclude from these hierarchical clusterings is that we can store urine uh, by each stabilization at room temperature for at least six months. Uh, then, because there are a lot of different biomarkers that are nowadays assessed in urine, we were trying to see what happens to the concentrations of those biomarkers after six months of preservation at room temperature. And if you look, if you look at these graphs over here, you have the correlation between uh, zero months of preservation and after six months of preservation. And most of the biomarkers, they have a coefficient of variation that is lower than 5%, which is uh, rather good. And we, ha we observe this behavior for all the urines um, tested. So our next steps concerning first the bladder cancer project uh, it's, of course, the validation of these biomarkers. Uh, the good thing about this, some of the proteins that we have identified as potential biomarkers for differentiated uh, tumor types of, of bladder cancer have been already described for, uh, from other groups. And so some of them are somehow validated. And what we are trying to do right now is to develop a targeting uh, MS approach to monitor these 70 proteins to do validation in a larger, larger, larger scale. Uh, in what concerns urine preservation, our goal right now is to see for how long can we store urine at room temperature. So far, we have six months, but six months, it's a rather short period of preservation. So actually, we are designing the experiments to extend to one year, two years, and four years. Let's see what happens with, this, with these preservations. Thank you very much for your, for your attention, and if you have questions. Well, okay, thank you very much, Hugo. So we are open for questions. Thank you very much, because I know they work pretty well, so I don't have questions. Oh, hello, Hugo. Very Hi. nice presentation. Thank you very much. It's very nice to hear you. <laughs> very calm. So, and very nice work. And uh, my question to you is that, since you, you, you decide to use the same approach as the NATO, yes. based on the fact that it's enzymes the is <laughs> the nature by heating. So my question is to you is that, do you think that in the urine there is enzyme activated, active? This is my first question. Yeah. The second question is related to that. Have you tried to analyze those precipitated pellet? Yes. And to see what is there? Yes. <laughs> and to compare if the after heating, what has happened? Uh, so actually, uh, concerning the first question about the enzymes, um, I don't think there are too many enzy active enzymes in the urine, especially after collection. But what you can have is bacterial growth. And um, of course, by eating, uh, you will at least minimize the, the growth of, of bacteria. And we didn't find any bacteria in these, in these uh, preservation after six months. It was uh, one of the reasons that we have an, an alternative preservation that was storing the maintainer card at minus 60 was if we have any, any bacterial growth during six months, but we didn't observe any. And uh, about what is in, in those pellets, uh, so actually we run some gels of the pellets before adding trees buffer and after um, <coughs> adding trees buffer. In the, f in the first, before adding the buffer, we have a lot of protein. After, we have um, much lower concentration of protein. Uh, so most of the protein were recovered to, to a, a solution. But either way, there is something there. So if you don't have the same extent of precipitation in all the samples, uh, you might have some fluctuations in terms of protein content in urine, which is um, 
a, prob a problem for proteomics analysis. So probably that precipitation is more aggregation, but in aggregation, yes. that the heat and somehow the nature, the, the protein that cannot anymore there, there aggregate, yes. it's not too much related to enzyme. Or but there is another thing, which is um, the, when you, you freeze the urine, you have a lot of salts that, that also precipitate. When you st eat stabilize the, pro the, um, the proteome, you don't have the salts anymore because they were ultrafiltrated in the fast membrane. So actually you only have the, the proteins on the membrane, you don't have salts anymore. Yes? Um, thanks Hugo, that was, is this on? Yeah, that was a really great talk. Thank um, you. So uh, I'm Veronica from Genentech and, and I, I think So um, we, I think this work is really important, the, the urine preservation work especially, because when we're designing clinical studies, you know, I'm a biomarker scientist, I'm constantly fighting with the clinical teams to include urine collection, because I think urinary biomarkers are really important. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a huge cost to implement collection yeah. of these samples and studies, and then storage is of course even more costly in the long term. So if, if this actually is applicable to not just the 70 proteins that you have in your panel, but rather, you know, the overall proteome of urine samples, then I think that would be hugely, like, it would change the way we, we do this all together. So my question, I guess, is have you looked outside of these 70 proteins to look at how um, the stability of the other proteins in the proteome, or have you just focused on these so far? No, actually, we have the stability in not the entire proteome because we, we didn't any fractionation of the urine proteins. Okay. So actually we were monitoring near 1,000 uh, proteins in urine without any fractionation. And so we have the quantities for these 1,000 proteins. Okay. Um, what we did was to pinpoint what is used nowadays as biomarkers in urine and specifically see what happens to the levels of these proteins in the way we preserve uh, at room temperature. And um, as what we saw is that um, most of the proteins, they have coefficients of variation lower than 5%, which wow. is, is very good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I'll catch up with you later. I have a lot yeah, okay. more questions. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, over there. Congratulations for the excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you find a lot of neutrophils, so probably these are pro-tumor neutrophils. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if you have uh, other inflammatory conditions, how would they affect your panel? How uh, specific can it be? Th that question is very, very interesting and very smart. Uh, from the data that I have nowadays, I, can't, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, well, I can have a clue because I have other uh, bladder conditions that are not cancer. Um, so if I can identify if those conditions are something related to inflammation, actually I can extract some information, but I don't have that data right now. Yeah, more questions? Okay. question is it worth investigating these proteins in plasma as well because it might be possible that the origin of these changes starts in plasma and then it ultimately filters well, through to the urine I, I think so actually some of these proteins that we have identified in urine are also present in plasma yeah. so definitely it's something that is worth it to, to investigate yeah. great talk Hugo thank you so, uh, so from a clinical perspective, typically what happens is, you know, if you look at the workflow of how a patient is evaluated, the patient comes to the urologist's office and they might do a cystoscopy, but they usually the first line of attack is to do urine cytology. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you've shown some really compelling data and, and, and I have another question, but I'll come to that later. 
But, but the first part of this is, so when the cytology assessment is being done, uh, in, especially in the academic centers, what we do is we prepare a smear, but we also prepare a cell block. So with the cell block, I get you know, probably 5,000 cells to look at. So there, there's a pretty good determination at that point of time in terms of whether this is cancer or whether we are dealing with a reactive process. Mm -hmm. With what you have shown here, if that is applicable on these cell blocks, you know, you could be giving an answer to the urologist yeah. whether this is non-invasive cancer, this is early stage invasive cancer, or this is high stage cancer, and that completely changes the way management is done in these patients. So this is something that could be, you know, really outstanding and, and change the way we manage stuff. Mm -hmm. Of course, the key question here is, has this been evaluated and validated on those? Actually, it's very interesting that you mentioned the cells. Uh, we would appreciate to have that samples to look at. Sure. Um, yeah. So I've, I've never thought on that, actually. Um, but I think uh, you can have like complementary information uh, like in a smaller time periods because you can collect urine very easily. And it could be a call for, for to prevent that the tumors uh, move forward in, in, in pro and progression. We so. should talk about a collaboration yeah, to yeah. look at it from that perspective. Yeah. The yeah. second question I had was, so, so you have these urine samples where, you know, I presume the, the, uh, the bladder cancer status of these patients is known. Yeah. So have you looked at the concomitant tissue samples to see if some of these show so up there? From the same urines, I don't have the tissue, okay. but actually we start the collection of tissues. Okay. So we have urine samples before surgery, then we have the tissue that was removed during surgery, and we have urine samples after surgery as well. Okay. Okay. So we are building a, a biobank of these types of samples to, to investigate that. Oh, so that opens up another question. <coughs> okay. So if you've looked at the urine samples before surgery, and you've looked at them after surgery, do you see a change? I, I, I don't see them yet. Okay. I don't know what happens yet. Yeah, 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 exactly. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Well, if there is no more questions, we thank you. Thank you very much, Hugo, for this nice talk.